It's the mindset. Free your mind. Free your mind. Mindset. Free your mind. Is gold. Everything that's white is snow On the mindset, I just start Let them know, let them know, let them know Oh, words from the wise I just start, we will never lie Stand tall, we will never die We'll forever shine I just start, shine like the star in the sky Some hate, some love Blessed love, pleasant, good day. Warm welcome, Mindset Program. I just start my host, and I want to greet the item officially in the divine name of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor El Selassie I, the first, Empress Men in the first, Holy Emmanuel I, King Selassie I, Ja, Rastafari. Beautiful viewers and subscribers, one more day above ground. And life is our ultimate position. Let's give thanks to that. All right. So, um, we just want to bring forth something to the eye them um, awareness. Zane, uh, uh, this is a, a video that I um, I recorded um, probably two months ago. Zane, yeah, probably about two months ago. And, um, it was about Pinnacle and Leonard P. Owell. I was um, privy to be a part of um, uh, this organization or this event, Zin. And um, yeah, it was about Pinnacle and Leonard P. Owell and a model of Rastafari sovereignty, Zin. It was, it was hosted by. Um, Sister Fanai Sunlight Selassie, Zin from Rastafari TV. Manners and respect, my sister. Peace and love. Also, it was hosted by Dr. Imani Tafari Ama. Zin, um, those two sisters was the host of the um, program. It was streaming live also on Rastafari TV. And our org Zin. Um I did record some of it, not not all of it, and I hope I'm not infringing up on any copyright here, um, putting this this out. Zin. But I think people need to know and hear um some of what was being um said in 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 in, a, in that um in that, you know, organization or uh, that event, Zin. So, I'm not going to do much talking still, you know what I mean? Because it's a little bit lengthy. So, I just go make the thing play and the item can, um, yeah, the item can, you know, full joy. You know, of course, there was um brother ranking stepper. Zin that that was a part of um the organizing of um that event. Zin, I want to bless up my brother. Manners and respect over there in Canada. Zin to to the eye. Um so basically, you know, does we give the eye them look a little um rundown as as it was said. Pinnacle, a model of Rastafari sovereignty and an introspective view into the founding father of Rastafari, Honorable Leonard P. Leonard Percival Howell, and his excellent example of self determination and sovereignty, becoming Jamaica's first sustainable multi multi million million dollar free slave community which has influenced many throughout the planet Zin and you know that was just something on the the flyer itself so I could just go in where we have to go in Zin manners and respect we organized a black history month rally at the St. William Grand Park 
and um, and also to have a march down King Street and to go down to the sea to heal and honor and show and pour libation for our ancestors. A simple event. We wrote to the police, we got permission from them. We wrote that they have set up a new entity now called ODPEM, um, Organization of Disaster Risk Management and so on. And we were directed that they were now in charge of all events since COVID. And we wrote to all these people, we got clearance to keep our event at the park and to do our march and so on. But despite this, because they had heard beforehand that we planned to demonstrate in front of the DPP's office, the Director of Public Prosecution's office, for her disrespectful and hateful ruling in the Enzinga, King, Enzinga Candace King's case, where she has ruled that Candace King was the one responsible for taking her locks off her head. And we are not in agreement with that. So we wanted on our way down King Street to stop and demonstrate outside her office and then continue our journey. The police came in full force at the at St. William Grand Park, full force, led by a man named F F Felix. I think he might have been a deputy superintendent and so on. Yet the documentation I had indicated that um, who the officers I was to liaison with. And I called them, the officer told me who. Never mentioned Felix, but Felix and his squad, which seems to be some sort of a, a draconian squad, they came to the park and prevented us from even starting. When we showed him our paperwork, him was vexed and mad and squadron of police came to the park. And um, uh, we, we, had, we, we, we were scheduled to start at one o'clock. We, we didn't get to start until three o'clock. I had to walk down to the Kingston and St. Andrew um, KSAC office at Church Street. I met with the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the CEO. All three of them, when I went down there, showed them the paperwork. They said, they, despite the fact that the paperwork said it was copy, to the Minister of Local Government, Desmond McKenzie, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Local Government, the CEO of the KCC. This, my letter said, said that it was copied to all of them. The mayor, the deputy mayor, and the CEO said they had not seen the letter. We're talking an age of computer, you know, an internet and they had not seen the letter. My letter was dated the 22nd of February and the event was the 24th. They said they had not seen any copy from ADPEM. So upon seeing the letter that I had, they then called the park people and said, yes, we are, they, we are to be allowed to keep our event. And I asked them, call the policeman, because he was the dragon there. And they called him and said, no, no, permitted to keep. So we didn't start till late. So I'm telling you all this. This is no, this is last week that we are still encountering these bitters against the police. Way down King Street in the march. I am driving my again after we didn't see Felix back up at the park after we get the, the clearance, you know, we didn't see. Clearly, he wasn't there now. We're not hearing you now, Brother Miguel. So I don't know if you're by the yes. deputy commission. We seem to have temporary loss, Brother Miguel, so uh, we'll 
He's the technical uh, necessary to get him back. He's back in just now. Actually, he's muted. Tell him to unmute. He's probably pushed the button by accident. Yes, Brother Miguel, you should uh, uh, unclick your mute button. Make sure your microphone is open. Yes, am I now unmuted? Yes, yes. Yes, go ahead, Brother Miguel. Seems as we blast over again. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not even. Mm. Yes. I don't know if you're all hearing me now. Yes, maybe yes, take, we are hearing you. Like, take, take, take your video. Boring. Take your video. Boring, off. Yeah, well. You can um, take off the video beside the microphone. Just click off the video and the, um, the audio will come through a bit better, okay? Brother Miguel, are you there? All right, no worries. What we'll do is um, we're going to go to um, with Dr. Barnett and then we'll um, bring Brother Miguel back on afterwards. So Dr. Barnett, if you're there, um, please come in and you can introduce yourself. And Brother Miguel, if you're hearing me, we'll, um, what we'll do is we'll bring you in after Dr. Barnett. Uh, are you there? Uh, just to remind you that Dr. Michael Barnett is a senior lecturer at the uh, in the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work at the University of the West Indies, specializing in African diaspora studies and critical race theory. He is a specialist on the subject of Leonard Howell. Dr. Barnett. Yeah. Like work right here. Well, it's a, such a big building. There's many buildings. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Barnett. Go right ahead. Yes. Um, everybody is seeing me all right? Yes, Dr. Yes, we see you and we hear you. All right. So essentially, um, my introduction to Leonard Howell and the surrounding history of Pinnacle and so forth. I should give thanks to um, people like Michael Boyd, um, who started the Leonard Hall Foundation. Um, also, you know, Kathy Hall was there from the beginning of the inception of the Leonard Hall Foundation. And um, there was an initiative, um, essentially, in from 2010 to actually have um, formal gathering or conference on Leonard Hall. Uh, it was seen as very important. So actually, in June of 2011, um, a group of us conference, had a, had, a, had a full conference on Leonard Hall, of which Ras Miguel Lawn was a part, um, Louis Moyston um, was, a, a, was a part of that. Um, also, we had um, Jelani Naya um, and Clinton Hutton, very importantly. So, but we were essentially, I want to big up Michael Boyd because he doesn't get enough recognition for really um, mobilizing us and having this conference. And then we invited Monty Howell and Billy Howell. Um, they flew in from the US and, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a good conference. Um, Ras Miguel gave the, the, the keynote speech um, centering on the trial of, of, of um, Leonard Howell and Robert Hines, the famous trial of 1934, um, the first notable persecution of Leonard Howell, of which he was sentenced to two years 
hard labor uh, and imprisonment and Robert Hines was sentenced to one year and, and hard imprisonment for the charge of sedition. And um, that's a notable occurrence in, in the history because we see that with the gatherings that they had, um, both Leonard Hall and, and Robert Hines, and very importantly, Robert Hines was a lieutenant of the, the Bedward movement, the Alexander Bedward movement, which we can see as a precursor to the Rastafari movement, as well as you know, that of the Honorable Marcus Garvey and so forth. So these two had very effective street rallies, both in Kingston and St. Thomas. And there was a lot of police um, surveillance of these street rallies and so forth. And so they made copious notes of what was being said at the rallies. So when Leonard Hall announced that we should see Haile Selassie I as our God and King and not King George of England, you know, this now was the, the, the basis on this, this, this charge of sedition. Wow, the audacity of Leonard Hall and Robert Hines to say that we should not, um, we, 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 we should not um, be under the, the patronage of King George V, who was the ruling sovereign at the time um, in terms of the British monarchy. And we should instead be hailing Haile Selassie I as our God and King. So this began the, the, the pattern of, of continuous persecution of Leonard Hall, um, definitely the most, I would say, persecuted Rastafari leader out of the, 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 the plethora of Rastafari leaders we've had. All, all notable Rastafari leaders have faced persecution of some sort or the other. And it's, you know, so even today, we have to be vigilant about possible persecution, even today, although Technically, we're out of the colonial period. So looking at this conference of 19, um, sorry, 2011 at UWE, um, we were able to have a fulsome, um, a fulsome forum on different aspects of Leonard Hall and, and the legacy he left and so forth. And out of that came the book that um, Sister Imani Tafari referred to um, the um, book called, you know, Leonard Percival Hall and the Genesis of the Rastafari Movement, in which we tried with various authors to document the um, inception of the Rastafari Movement in the early years, all of the early uh, inspirations and all of the um, early um, impacting historical events that led to the inception of the movement. But Leonard Hall, beyond that trial, um, was also ended up jailed in Bellevue, notably in 1938. Um, some people have argued that this was so that he would not be an agitator in the, the, the riots that took place, the um, protests of the, the, the labor movements and so forth that were ongoing in Jamaica in 1938, very, very, very notably. But were Leonard Holders at the time in Bellevue, um, but nonetheless, he gets out of Bellevue in 1939 and is able to essentially um, formally, formally uh, incorporate the Ethiopian Salvation Society. So this in January 1939, this is incorporated. And he does this essentially as, as a rallying point and to show his allegiance and support of the Ethiopian italian War, which of course was going on, still going on between Ethiopia and Italy. Because Italy, as everyone knows, um, under the, the, the rule of Mussolini, um, really wanted to try and acquire Ethiopia as a colony after the failed attempt of the Battle of Adawa in 1896, where Ethiopia was under the rule of, of, of Menelik II, Emperor Menelik II, and we're going to be celebrating the Battle of Adawa on March the 1st, which is coming fast on Tuesday coming. 
So what we find is that um, Leonard Howell still carries on his, with his work. And, and, and as Monty alluded to, despite all of these persecutions, his imprisonment and setbacks, he still carries on relentlessly. And this should be, be a credit. We, we must not take this for granted. The, 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 the immense pressure and persecution he's under. So that in January 1940, notably on, on Ethiopian Christmas, 7th of January, announces to his congregation he had great news that, that their largest state would soon be at the disposal of Rastafari and, and, and those who were interested in, 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 in exercising their freedom and their sovereignty. And formally, actually, on the 25th of April, 1940, um, Pinnacle was purchased by Alfred Chang for the price of 900 pounds. And I should just say that Alfred Chang was, was, was the intermediary to purchase Pinnacle because at that time for a black man to purchase so much land, 500 acres, was, was no easy feat. So um, it was thought that Alfred Chang would be, being a Chinese man, would be a useful intermediary to, to, to um, facilitate the transaction. And so he purchased it for 900. And the agreement was that um, Leonard Hall would repurchase from Alfred Trang at the price of 1,200 pounds, which was a lot of money back in those days, a fair amount of money. In other words, 1,200, so that Chang would obviously have a, make a profit of, of 300 pounds. Um, what is on record is that Howell did give a down payment of 800 pounds. Um, um, that is on record. And so there was a, a mortgage arrangement, if you like. And, and this was what I must emphasize prevented the authorities from formally evicting the Rastafari community um, for more than a decade and a half. Um, so the, the, the community at, at, at Pinnacle was never a squatter community. I must emphasize that because there seems to be a lot of different narratives out there and people think that man just go out of land and capture it. No, money was spent and the land was legally bought. There was an, an arrangement. I just want to emphasize also these are colonial times. You couldn't just go in and just capture land and sit pretty and, 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 and in a couple of months, you could be, be chased out and so forth. And especially the amount of attention that Hull was still getting. He was still very much resented by the political forces, by the authorities in Jamaica. So even when the community settled there um, from the start of 1940, a notable incursion and a disruption to the peace and tranquility of the community happens from as early as 1941. And I just want to make note of that because I don't want people to think that the community was just there undisturbed um, and so forth and, and um, actually accepted by the wider society, no such thing. So June 1941, a detective corporal Samuel from the Spanish Town Police Station, travels to Pinnacle with two other officers because they were prompted to do so by the information of James Nelson, apparently a bail jumping gunman from St. Thomas had sought refuge there at Pinnacle, or so was the report. So Samuels and the two detective constables drive up to Pinnacle to make an arrest. But notably, you know, there were guards at the, at, at the gates, the front gates of Pinnacle. So you couldn't just come in uh, willy nilly and just come through into the, into the community. It was, it was a gated community, if you like. And there was security at the gate. So only Samuels notably was allowed to, was admitted to Pinnacle. But Howell dealt with him rather sternly. He let him know that in no uncertain terms, could he come in and, and make any demands that, that Pinnacle was a sovereign community and that in no uncertain terms, Mr. Nelson would not be handed over. So uh, Samuels left in a huff and a puff and he was very upset about that, as you can imagine. And then apparently there was a calm before the storm, but a little more than a month later on the 14th of July, 1941, 115 policemen under the, 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 the um, supervision of the deputy commissioner raid Pinnacle 
and and I would say this is, was was really uh, revenge for the outcome of the first visit. Um, so 115. So there's a considerable amount of policemen coming in, and while they avoided significant damage to the houses on Pinnacle, the ganja plants, various ganja plants, were uprooted from a field close to to hold several hundred ganja plants. So even then, you could see that the, the ganja, the cash crop of the community was targeted, but they decided not to cause major structural damage and so forth, because there was talk of just bulldozing houses, burning them down and so forth, but, but, but that they, they relented on that. There were many arrests, 70, at least 70 men were arrested but Leonard Hall was able to avoid capture at that time, but then they returned the next morning, able to um, capture Leonard Hall, and he's subsequently try, tried and convicted and is in prison for a further two years. And then we fast forward now um, to 45, where, 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 where several lawyers, um, one of them, um, Robert Lake, I, if I recall, um, from a firm. Anyway, they come to Pinnacle in 1945 um, with some papers and, and they attempt an eviction procedure, but they are told subsequently some paperwork is produced um, by Leonard Howell and, and, and his officers, and they have to relent. So it, there was an eviction attempt um, in 1945, but this was unsuccessful because paperwork was um, produced to prevent this. Um, 1945. Then we fast forward again to 1954. And 1954, this is the first real major raid of Pinnacle. And this is the beginning of the downfall of this self sufficient community. So they, they burn the houses down. Uh, several houses, they burn the, the, uh, the crops, all the food crops, and not just the ganja. The pretext of the raider was ganja. Let me just say that. So it wasn't on the basis that they were living on the land illegally as such. But that, that ganja raid really did disrupt. That was a major disruption in the community. That was 1954. So um, Bustamante was still the ruling premier at the time. Mm -hmm. So under his administration, we have this major ganja raid. But the persecution continues notably, and I noticed Monty made note of it. So 1956, there is another raid on Pinnacle, which is more um, an eviction raid to get rid of, of, of community members who still resided on the land. So something happened between 54 and, and 56 that they were able to go as far as eviction. Um, there's talk that in the first ganja raid, the, the, the paperwork for the property of Pinnacle could have been confiscated by the authorities or could have been burnt in the fire because you know, the great house where Leonard Hall resided was, was significantly damaged in that raid of 1954, as well as many of the other surrounding houses. But nonetheless, so we have an eviction raid 56 and there's even a subsequent incursion into Pinnacle because you had some people, a few stragglers, if you like, who are still living there. Um, 1958, now everything is, is burned to the ground and, and all of the, the stragglers who are left there are summarily evicted. So by 1958, then Pinnacle is no more a community, a Rastafari community. And um, as such, I'm one of those persons who feel that any, certainly the surviving Holites who resided at Pinnacle, and in fact, you know, Monty himself and, and Billy, um, those people who, are, who lived at Pinnacle and survived or had to go through the trauma, I should say, of, the, of these raids, of these notable raids in the 50s, should be um, given some compensation for the, for the trauma they suffered. So that while we've seen that some retribution has been made for Coral Gardens, uh, thanks to the Rastafari Coral Gardens Benevolent Society <clears throat> for negotiating that. So there has been some compensation for that. The 1963 atrocity against Rastafari 
um, nothing has happened in terms <clears throat> meaningfully, meaningfully in terms of reparations um, for Leonard Hall and, I, 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 and, and, and those persons, the whole lights, some of who are still alive, who used to reside at Pinnacle. Um, so that's another thing I want to, to stress, and I'm an advocate for that. So a lot of people know who've gotten interest in Pinnacle and so forth, that's great. And there has been also this issue of the plots being allocated uh, for Pinnacle as a national heritage site. At the moment, we only have one plot that has legally been registered as a national heritage site. And I don't think that is adequate. And unfortunately, we have had some inside um, disagreements within the Rastafari community. I am not going to speak at length for that, but this is a reality that has actually impeded, impeded the um, allocation of, of lots at Pinnacle because there's been two such incursions. And all those familiar with the history will know, but um, in 2009, well, let me just name the organization, an organization that had, had been um, basically founded in 2007. And it was a, a, at that time a proud movement for the Rastafari movement as a whole, because this was a, a, a move to, to try and centralize the movement. The name of that organization is the Rastafari Millennium Council. Um, well, that's the shortened version of the name, but 2007. So that was a proud moment. Um, basically in September of 2007, formally launched to mark the millennium, the Ethiopian millennium on the Ethiopian calendar. Um, however, um, you know, for one reason and the other, um, when three lots were being declared as a heritage site in 2009, this was blocked by that group. Um, the RMC. And then subsequently, um, 2014, um, notably, um, we have the Occupy Pinnacle movement, um, which was really um, uh, pushed and, 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 and manned largely, peopled largely by the Rastafari Youth Initiative Council. But this was not seen in a, in a, in a positive light by the Rastafari Millennium Council. We're talking about 2014 here. These are watershed marks. And they, um, an email was sent out that they must be physically removed, should be physically removed from the, um, from Pinnacle. But, you know, a consensus had not been uh, arrived at with all the mansions and, and organizations of Rastafari about this, but they just indiscriminately just, just threw out this email that they thought that they, and then the, the, also the argument was, was that, um, that anything to do with Pinnacle, they have the absolute last word and so forth. So April, 2014, um, and, and the last straw was the, uh, really the ejection of Sister Mitzi Williams, who was then the chairperson of the organization. So when she was unceremoniously um, thrown out as the chairman of the movement, um, there was a, a all mansion meeting that was met at Liberty Hall, April um, um, 2014, where it was decided that um, you know people would withdraw their support from the, that current council. Um, that current group of the Millennium Council. And uh, that was arrived at, but um, it doesn't seem as though that decision was accepted by those particular officers of the Millennium Council. And so uh, subsequently, um, they continued to do their own thing, irregardless of the wishes and whims of other mansions of Rastafari. I'm talking about major mansions here, 12 tribes of Israel, Baba Shanti, and even the Nayabingi house, um, broadly speaking. So essentially, um, fast forward now to 2017, the government try again to um, 
a lot additional lots to Pinnacle to the one lot there. They wanted they, they, there was some there was a table on the table was an offer from the National Heritage Trust to a lot five additional lots 2017. This was blocked by the RMC. Um, and, and so that, 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 that initiative has, has stalled because um, nothing has happened there so far as Pinnacle is concerned. Now, um, so that, that's something that I think needs broad consideration and so forth, because in terms of the allocation of National Heritage um, lots, we, we cannot blame the government for not attempting to allocate uh, more than the one lot that is there, all right? Uh, we cannot, that's, that's an in, internal issue that has, has come up and that needs to be addressed, I think, in, in short order. So that's something that when we talk about the future of Pinnacle, that we need to look at very seriously. And, and there are lots of issues. For instance, as Monty said, his mother um, is buried um, at the back of the um, at, at the back of the where, where, where the, the tabernacle presently is, and that burial spot may just be outside of the one lot that 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 uh, is prescribed. So that 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 burial spot could technically be disturbed. Now let me just say that without that heritage site um, proclamation, there is no um, basically. With, Oh, that proclamation that, that, that there is no protection from the land being disturbed by the developers and so forth. And, and, and the, the land still remains in the hand of the develop, developers, the, the Lake family, and legally they are able to, to do anything they want to with any of the other lots that remain uh, unallocated. This is a reality. Um, so I don't know why people are just sitting on the fence watching and seeing what happens. And, and we have things like the bakery and we have things like um, major burial grounds, the tree burial, burial grounds, major burial grounds at Pinnacle, which could not have been in place, by the way, if this was a squatter community. Just let me just say, you have 10 chains, you have... Um, you have a, a free major uh, burial ground. So th that those deserve to be protected. And under the five additional lots, they would come under some kind of protection uh, and not being disturbed. So um, that to me is a, is, is, is a serious issue, which I think has been largely ignored by many in the Rastafari community. So I'd like that to be part of the conversation and, and, and uh, possible reparations for those remaining whole lives who suffered personally the trauma of being evicted from the property. So um, I'm just going to leave it there. I could go on and on, but I just want to, I, I, was, I was imploring Ofari and I, I, I have to give him credit for, you know, initiating this forum that we want a, a concise program. So let me not um, contribute to deviating from that. So thank okay. you. I want to thank you, Dr. Barnett, for your um, graphic contribution and that timeline that you wove uh, tracing the um, legal tribulations that Leonard Howell experienced. And at this time, we'd like to invite Brother Miguel to, to, to wrap his, his presentation because you got disconnected, Brother Miguel, in the middle of your, your, your talk. You had described the... Uh, March that you were involved in last week and the analogy that you, re, you, you, you drew between that experience and what Leonard Howell would have experienced in his time vis-a-vis -vis relations with the police. And you pro probably want to continue and make the connections as you wrap. Uh, greetings, I don't know. Y'all are hearing me now? Very much so. Thank you very much. Yeah. Deep thanks. Deep thanks. Right, I just to point out that you know we might think that we have made great strides, but you'd be amazed in in this land, the pillars of of Babylon that that plagued Leonard Howell, 
um, the police, the courthouse, the media, especially the gleaner, um, the prisons, the, the madhouse, because a lot of times when our brothers and sisters were taken to court, when the evidence was not strong enough to imprison them, they were then sent to Bellevue. And, and, and a, a classic example of that is, um, for example, in 1972, when Jabuk, that's Jabuk, one of our outstanding brother, known as Junior Hines, when he went to court in 1972 and refused to take an oath by any other name except Haile Selassie, he was sent to Bellevue for psychiatric assessment before the judge would have continued with his case. So I bring up all that to show the bravery of Leonard Howell in 1934. Yeah. Um, the, the, the bravery of Leonard Howell uh, when he stood before the court in 1934 and declared Haile Selassie to be the almighty God and the returned Messiah. No, he, he was greatly persecuted. And even at that trial in 1934, the trial, the judge that tried him out in St. Thomas was William Lyle Grant, Robert William Lyle Grant, who was a white judge. Um, he was the chief justice, but not long before that, he had tried many brothers and sisters in Malawi brothers and sisters who had risen up against the government, colonial government Malawi for their independence, especially John Chil. And uh, many of those brothers and sisters were sent, were hanged, were executed. Chilem himself had escaped, but he died whilst crossing the river. So I'm saying that saying a dragon like that to try Leonard Howard in 1934. He really couldn't have gotten a fair trial. And the jury just took 15 minutes to have found him guilty. Now, remember, he was deported in November. Seems that we have lost uh, Brother Miguel once again. In the meantime, Questions are adoring. Yes. I'm going to go into the questions. Yes, brother, brother Sankofa, you, you could bring the questions forward that you'd like to pose to brother Miguel and um, Dr. Michael uh, Barnett and, and have them Remarks. consider that. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Brother Miguel is back. Yes. So, you know, Brother Mike has gone through quite a bit of history, which I will not repeat. But nevertheless, I will point out that the pinnacle as a sovereign state, because when you think of sovereignty, you think of independence. And the whole idea in, by 1940 to be setting up an independent state where Rastafari right now wouldn't have to go and beg Babylon work. That in itself would have come on a great persecution. And then when one remembers Bustamante's letter, Bustamante wrote a very devious letter in 1939, in which he named Leonard Howell as a problem to Jamaica, and which he recommended that Howell be sent to the mental institution. So, with Bustamante doing that, and with Howell trying to set up a, a state whereby Rastafari would be away from Babylon, would be able to practice our tenets and our principles, and so on. This is an affront to the system. What is also ironic is that when Pinnacle was raided, in one woman's house, they found 800 pounds. Now, other people's houses were raided and lots of money was 
pounds. So it was a self-sustaining community. But the importance of that 800 pounds was that that was 800 pounds that Leonard Howell paid to Albert Chang. He used Chang as a front to buy the property and then paid him 800 pounds. And, and you're talking about 500 acres of land. So just use your mind now to say that at that time, having if 800 pounds could have bought 500 acres of land, it was a strong community. And this was just one woman's house. And I'm going off the police report. They had a newspaper named Mirror. And in their report, in their newspaper, they list the amount of money they found. And you know, police from that time to this time, whatever they put as figures, you, you multiply that by three to get an accurate account. They were no different then, especially when they were under the white man, and they are no different now. So, and what's everywhere that Howell set up his camp, he raised the red, gold, and green flag. At Princess Street, he set up a little camp there when they had rushed him out of St. Thomas. For a while, he sojourned in Kingston. At 108 Princess Street, he set up camp there. And once when they all had a feast, they raised the red, gold, and green flag. The police and citizens went there, burned down the flag, burned down the flagpole, stole all the food, and brutalized the brothers and sisters there. So that encouraged Howell to realize that he can stay in the city. They had a bakery at Bond Street, which is downtown also, and they had interest in the city. But then he realized that the city was too clogged up for his movements. And so that was how they went all the way up at Pinnacle in St. Catherine to set up on this land which they bought. And even there, they were persecuted. But you know, despite all of these raids, 54, 56, 58, and I should point out the 58 raid is very important because by then now they burnt down a lot of their brothers and so. And many of the brothers and sisters that left Pinnacle in 58 went down to Baca Wall. Baca Wall now is where um, beside Tivoli Gardens and where Prince Emmanuel had set up the camp of the Bobo Shanties and where Prince Emmanuel had called a great convention in 1958, which was attended by nearly 5,000 Rastafarians. And when they marched to St. William Grand Park, the same park which they, 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 they wanted to chase us out of last week, Thursday, that was where Prince Emmanuel was arrested. And he was taken over to Central, where he was almost beaten to death. And of course, he was charged for treason and sedition also, which was the of many early Rastafarian and strong Rastafari brethren. So in terms of Pinnacle being a sovereign state, an independent state, a state where you fly a flag, a state where you had to come through a gate to enter, a state where ref how we refer to himself as Guru Maharaj, which is the Hindu name for King of Kings or Holy King, and running it like a state, you would draw the air of the Jamaican society. And they would do everything to have mashed down Pinnacle, because that was much too independent for them, to have mashed down oil, um, who was setting up that independent structure way out of their sight and so on. And um, it wasn't just ganja alone grown there. They were doing, they were growing peas, corn, lots of things from per persons that I've spoken to. They were making shoes, they were making whitewash. They had livestock, they had chickens, goats, cows and all of that running up there and so forth. So it was a self-sustaining community, brothers and sisters. And whilst they were doing that, Leonard Howell had places in Kingston where he would carry out his commercial ventures, where people would come to him, where he would provide medicines to heal people, 
right in front of the Central Police Station on East Queen Street, uh, on the opposite side of the police station. He had his officer. He also had an office out at Outlook Avenue, Kingston. So that's where he carried out his commercial ventures. But you know this was too much for them. So that was all to earn this money and so on. So awesome. brothers and sisters, yes, it was self-sustaining community. Yes, it was trampled upon by Babylon. And that to a great extent, they when they didn't when they didn't have enough evidence to send him to prison, they sent him to Bellevue. But he consistently, consistently. Pinnacle survived up until 1981. Up until 1981, brothers and sisters were living at Pinnacle. How we liked. It was a court order that eventually removed people like um, the, um, people like Edgar. I, I'll get his last name for you because um, he was an important person. Yeah, Edgar Reed. Not until 1981. And Edgar Reed, when Judge Parker at Spanish Town asked him um, whether or not she, the judge, was at, because he, he told her that Howell's land is from to shore, from sea to sea. And when she said, am I sitting on Howell's land? He said, oh, yes, Your Honor. You are on Howell's land, our father's land. So that was not just Howell, but the Howellites. They had a bravery, they had a confrontational approach, they never bowed, and they stayed strong right throughout. And that is what gives us today the power to carry on. Thank you so if much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I wanted to. Thank you both for you and Dr. Barnett for coming on as a special guest today. Um, speaking of the theme of sovereignty,
subscribe button. See you on. I guess start the mindset. Smash that subscribe button. See you on the next video. I guess.